we shall have time to ask a couple of questions. And I suppose as we have um, a very uh, small number of um, people, I would like to uh, thank Ronde Company for the organization. I would like to thank the Russian experts because most of them uh, left already. Uh, thank you very much, Piotr Tsarikov, uh, because you are the only person left here. Thank you for brilliant uh, surgery and brilliant uh, lecture. And uh, our uh, Russian uh, colleagues, uh, if you have already been to St. Petersburg, you are welcome to come once again. And our foreign colleagues do not uh, come to us very uh, frequently. So that is why we are going to have a home task for them, for them to pass the examination and next time to spend much more interesting time here. So all our team is uh, being occupied at the moment. So that's why I'm the only person who is um, uh, going to do this, you know, uh, awarding ceremony. Maybe, Amjad, this is for you. And if you allow me, I'm uh, everyone. Yes, uh, no, I haven't forgotten anybody. Okay, I haven't left behind anybody. Okay, that's good. Thank you uh, once again. Now uh, we shall be connected to the operating uh, theater. Oh, it's uh, a little bit crammed. I mean, the uh, final ceremony, the ceremony of uh, closing the uh, conference. But I suppose it won't ruin the impressions of the conference. I hope uh, that it has been a very successful conference. Thank you very much to, to just everyone. Now we're going to connect to the operating theater. Alexei, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, and uh, we're going to show you the picture because we are still uh, deciding which camera to use. We shall probably take the laparoscopic camera uh, just in our hands, and uh, we shall show you. Uh, Yup is going to come closer to com make a commentary on the specimen just in uh, the very shortest time we shall show you. While we are still uh, have no picture of the specimen, um, Yop is asking the uh, audience, knowing that the patient has such anatomic uh, features, do you think that it was the best option for this patient to do the TME in this situation? Maybe that would be the, the variant for discussion, I suppose, a question for discussion. What would uh, the options for this patient be, knowing now uh, would it be observation, transrectal microsurgery, traditional or conventional uh, uh, TME, or the option that we, maybe Piotr Vladimirovich and Nuna, while you are still here, please come to the panel. And I would ask all the experts to comment. You can see that the uh, experts are going to have completely different opinions, maybe, maybe, and you will uh, give us your opinions, your expert opinion on this patient. Uh, Nuna, maybe you start uh, your your opinion about the uh, option for this best option for this patient. Last one, yeah. Well, uh, 
Uh, T1. T1. And residual cell, non-radical, non submucosal, non-radical, submucosal resection. So, and I'll try to, to ask, I'll try to, to answer in a very honest way because yesterday, uh, two days ago, I had the opportunity of, of, of watching this patient and observing this patient with a team of doctors that were already in the hospital looking at the, at the MRIs, at all the data. So, we had a similar case two weeks ago or three weeks ago in my department because we had this lady, a uh, 40-year-old lady, who had a very large mass in the rectum, like a polypoid mass, but still a four and a half by three centimeters polypoid mass. So what we did was what we really were very, we were very honest with the lady and said, we are going to do a major biopsy. We're going to do a transanal procedure, but without violating the planes of the TME. And so we did, and we, got, we did a submucosal dissection, and the result came back as a, y, as a PT1. But unfortunately, although the margins were completely uh, correct, it was an SM3. And as you know, we have, a, we have a huge possibility of nodal disease. It's like 15% maybe, but still, for a lady of 40 years old, it's something you, you should consider. And so in the MDT, it was a very, very tough decision. We also asked experts like Professor Hamjad to give us a, 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 an idea about that. But all in all, the agreement was that she should be offered a resectional TME or a complete TME. So I think that they did the correct decision because the, the first surgery did not compromise the end oncological results. So there was not a full thickness. So it was a submucosal. All the planes were complete, and we saw it in the beginning when, when, when it was operated. We could see the, the TME plane, and so that's only my opinion, but please. Uh, I'm Jad. I, I always believe in doing the easy things. So I think I would do the easy operation. Uh, Nuno, may I ask a, a, a question for you? Uh, uh, why you don't use uh, uh, watch uh, and weight strategy, radiotherapy for this patient. Okay, so... Uh, she, she was also so big, fat. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, 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 she's excellent. She, and also the, the laparoscopic TME was, uh, was a nice surgery also. But we, uh, we didn't have, I didn't have time enough to explain the, the approach, but the idea is that we are very selective in using radiation in our patients. So for T1, T2 disease, even T3, if we have mesorectal fascia not involved and we don't care about nodes, although they, if there's nodes near the margin, there's a discussion, but even if you have N2 disease in the mesorectum, it's all going to be out with a proper TME. So no radiation okay. for this lady. Okay. Um, well, I, I didn't have the advantage of seeing the patient, so I don't know her, but... Um, um, I think there are two or three important points because, to be honest, no one really knows what to do in this situation. No one knows the truth. Um, but I think there are two or three important points. One point is I think you need imaging before you start cutting anything. Um, so having, I think having MRI before taking out the primary is, is hugely important because if you do it afterwards then you don't know anything nodes can be enlarged, uh, you can have reaction, and you don't know what it is. So I think that's one important point. And the other important point, I think, is really to look at the patient. And what I um, try to do in these situations now is to have some sort of objective risk assessment. So really uh, trying to look what is the morbidity and mortality in this individual patient and weigh this up against what is the risk of uh, this patient having uh, uh, lymph node metastasis and then making a, a very uh, balanced decision on whether uh, putting the patient through the risks of, of a full TME or not. But, uh, okay, let's... Давайте посмотрим... ...to do uh, uh, such kind of surgery, big surgery. Uh, what is the best uh, option for these patients, in your opinion, Amjad? I mean, uh, we, we uh, saw uh, to, uh, these days uh, 
as a minimum four options yeah. for. Uh, yeah. But uh, we uh, unfortunately use only uh, can use only one <laughs> for uh, each yeah, of I think, them. I think it comes back to the same thing as we discussed that it it really doesn't matter um, what you use to get to the end point, and the end point is an intact, embryologically intact mesorectal specimen, as has been shown in the last day or two. If you are comfortable or trained to do an anatomical open surgery, and then that should be the best option in your hand, individually. We are talking of individual surgeons uh, to do this. Um, if you are trained to do it laparoscopically, um, then you should do laparoscopically because you are trained to do it and hopefully would achieve the same result and so forth for robotic surgery or bottom-up surgery. Then what I'm trying to say really is that the goalpost doesn't change. The goalpost is still about embryological surgery, respecting the cancer plane, and trying to achieve an R0 resection. Now, you can use different route to get there. You know, you could be trained in uh, really good, so if you ask me how would I prefer, of course I would prefer to do it with a robot because I think it's easier in a sense that I've trained myself in a way where I recognize everything, it makes it easier in my hand doing it robot. Uh, if, if, if it is you doing it, I'm sure you are a fantastic open surgeon, you are comfortable with it, you know you're going to get there, or you do it laparoscopically, as you do in your option. You're not going to say, I'm going to start robotic surgery with a case like this. So what I'm trying to say is that really it has come down to um, what we are comfortable with, but the goalposts should not change. We should not, I should not be saying that either I, I rather should try it laparoscopically because open may be difficult and I'm not trained in laparoscopy. So the goalpost really has to be your comfort level and your competence level. So my answer would be that I would not attempt bottom up because I think it's a very difficult operation. Okay. Yes? I, I just think <coughs> that, uh, to come back to this situation, I think the situation of this patient is, is a dilemma that we won't resolve um, this year or next year. But I think we probably will resolve it in the next five to ten years. Because I think uh, diagnostics will become better. Because this is basically a staging procedure that we did to find out whether there is any lymphatic disease or not. Uh, and I think uh, surgical staging procedures will disappear with time because diagnostics will become um, to such a level that we will have a clear answer. Я думаю, что проблема на раннем этапе, когда... I think that the problem at an early stage when there is diagnostics and when there is pre-op diagnostics before this primary uh, tumor is removed, the problem has always been with this diagnostic that with a huge BMI patients, we had rigid proctoscopy. You did rectoscopy, didn't you? And most probably, as it was uh, very close to the anal canal, this small tumor, you actually you missed it. You just uh, went through it, and the colonoscope uh, was capable to see it. Yes, most probably, that's uh, one of the most uh, difficult problems. And uh, in the surgery, it's clear that it's very close to the dentate line and to the surgical margin, as it is quite big. And it's uh, immediately after the surgical margin. And uh, if you saw it, if you could uh, l see it, then in uh, tail, probably, the correct way will be to do the tail, tail and then to do, uh, do all the um, uh, uh, dissection along the walls, and then the, to stage it, and then further on to decide what to do, TME or something else. Okay, maybe that would be the m more correct sort of approach. If you could see it in the pre-op, Yes, we're talking about this, but the patient uh, was admitted with verified um, rectal cancer, and on MRI, we did not detect any lesions, any lymph node lesions. In the uh, finger test of the rectum, we did not find anything, and uh, we looked at this patient as a candidate for transrectal microsurgery. But in the uh, rigid rectoscope, test, uh, uh, we did not uh, see tumor. So that's why we examined the patient uh, alongside uh, with a specialist with a flexible endoscope. And he uh, showed it eight centimeters away from preanal skin or preanal fold. And then I tried to find it once again. I didn't find it. I discussed it with the patient, and I decided to do endoscopy under the mucose layer. 
So this is the first patient that uh, we had, and we didn't know the correct. And uh, but for this conference, we would have um, um, uh, sent him for transanal microsurgery. So full dissection of the scar, and then further on we shall consider the situation f further on. We can watch and see. We can do local dissection, wide surgery, and I would agree with Daniela that we should first of all assess the risks. Uh, to what extent this patient is comfortable anatomically speaking uh, and how um, dysuria or other sexual or sexual dysfunction can uh, be a result of surgery. From the UK experience, uh, we do see a lot of patients now with bowel cancer screening um, that are at a very early stage of rectal cancer and colon cancer. And um, sometimes the polyps are taken away in endoscopy thinking that it's a benign polyp, but on histology you get that it is a focus of cancer. And they are a big dilemma for any MDT trying to discuss to see what's the best way forward. As a surgeon, the uh, knee-jerk response would be to go for a TME and a low anterior resection, but what we do forget and did, but did, I'm just, did touch upon was that quality of life after surgery is something that we should also focus on. So if we have a patient who is 80 year old and had a bowel cancer screening and had a polyp removed with clear margins or with no bad features on histology like uh, a good differentiation, no lymphovascular invasion, it's very sensible to offer that patient a follow-up. Now, how do we follow it up? It's still not very clear. It might mean regular endoscopy every three months or six months, regular MRI to check for any recurrent disease. And yes, we accept that if there is a disease recurrence, you can offer them a salvage operation later to have the operation. But in a 45-year-old uh, with a slightly bigger lymph node with cancer, uh, polyp with a cancer and bad features on histology, sometimes we are more on the side of surgery. If we know about the polyp is cancerous, then transanal endoscopic microsurgery or TEMS is a reasonably good option to give the pathologist one big slice that they can look at and tell us in more clarity about the depth of invasion and the risk of lymph node metastasis. But if anything, it is already known as cancer. We offer them preoperative short course radiotherapy and then give a gap of six weeks and then perform transanal endoscopic microsurgery. We have limited data from this TREC trial, which is a national trial running in the UK, but three years data now and it's all looking very promising. And as Danilo said, another two or three years down the line, if we have more data on that for early cancers, perhaps we may not need to do too many extensive operations in the future. Can I, can I ask a question to everybody? Mm. Uh, my, uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is, what would you, you all colorectal surgeons, what would you do for your patient? Would you recommend a TME or would you recommend to a different strategy? Who would do a TME? Or this for, for this patient. This, this particular yeah, patient. Yeah. Or no so uh, uh, for this patient. Healthy, healthy patient, um, 60 years old. 60 year old. Fit and healthy. Fit and healthy, no yeah. issues to have. Yeah, yeah. Who would do a TME? SM3. SM3? Yes, this situation. So we don't know what it is. We don't know this situation, yeah. No, so let's... Uh, this like, like this. This let's situation. This, this, this situation. Yeah. So but in mean? a fit and healthy patient. So... Who, who, would, who would do a TME in, in a patient? No one wants to do TME. So please raise your hands who would uh, do in this particular case uh, TME. No one? And what about transanal, transanal dissection? Local excision. For, for local excision, for local excision. Uh, Your bigger biopsy, yeah. then decide what he needs. That's what I think what the consensus is. Okay. Uh, Alexei has said that if not a conference here, uh, actually it has some influence, of course. So I think uh, he said he would do a revision with operational proctoscope, knowing that it's a posterior wall, he would see this lesion, and he will do local excision. But it looked, uh, it really looked uh, quite promising uh, for uh, for the for the conference, and it, it was very good. Uh, and he actually he met his expectations. He had a good specimen, and we could be sure that in this patient, no matter what stage uh, he has, he actually he get. Uh, preventive resection. The other thing, it's a functional result. That's important. So the functional outcome here could be, let's say, different. Looking at the picture from uh, the, uh, the image from the operating theater, uh, may I interrupt our uh, uh, 
uh, matters. So to move uh, in the downtown, he has only 40 minutes to move in the downtown. But I would like to discuss one more issue coming back to the words uh, by in which Noon said. Uh, here you mentioned the strategy waiting watch, which uh, today becomes quite a popular in Europe. And uh, many of uh, those uh, messages, many hearing such messages, they think that radio and chemo radiation, uh, they come to the first, uh, to the foreground when treating rectal cancer. I will leave with you with my comment to discuss it because I'm really short of time. So I'd like to say that today, those days in Europe, we have. Uh, uh, we see quite a serious movement, if I can say so, uh, for uh, uh, to stratification, to selective attitude to T3 stage, despite that all guidelines state that T3 must be irradiated. So today T3, and today almost all talks today uh, said that T3 should be stratified into the low and high risk tumors. We should stratify T3 and those two types. And combined treatment should be provided only to uh, high risk tumors. That uh, regretfully is uh, related with uh, found uh, shortcomings of, co of combined uh, treatment uh, caused by uh, radiation therapy because it dramatically affects life of, of the patients. That's why having such a potent, uh, potent weapon as a combined treatment, we should use clearly according to the indications. And I think that those conferences are, are aimed to find this, these clear indications where we have to use this radiation therapy in the best interest, for the best interest of our patients. And this, uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry that I cannot continue to stay with you. And, uh, and I would like to thank you all for that. Uh,